welcome everyone um i hope you've enjoyed sessions today so far you've had a great lunch break we're at the penultimate session now in the home stretch it's been such a cracking few days um it's a great one we've got for you now it's about everyday participation something we all do right so with our guest and over the floor uh don't forget this is being recorded so if you have to nip away um you can catch up on it later and it's going to be online for two weeks um, and also don't forget, you can ask questions in a couple of ways. So either you can put it in the chat box or keep the lively discussion going. Um, but also feel free, um, Oliver would like to invite some participation from the audience. So if anybody wants to jump on and share their audio and video, um, we'll let you know when you can do that. Uh, so you'd be most welcome. So to introduce you to Oliver, uh, Oliver has an interest in economic democracy and a background in community ownership, having helped to take Bath City Football Club into community ownership uh, and served on the board of Supporters Direct. He now works as a senior strategist at New Citizenship Project, helping organisations to develop more participatory cultures while also studying, I don't know how you're doing this as well, mate, the sociology of community ownership as a part time doctoral researcher at Goldsmiths College. So. Welcome, Oliver. We're so pleased to have you here. Um, Alexander, I, I imagine. Ah, is that because we've we kept you up? I'm, I'm imagining as well. There's lots of threads that we're discovering, sort of throughout the festival, that are really meshing together. So um, we might even be able to bring in some previous sessions that we've all been to that relate yeah, to this conversation as well. Absolutely. But I will hand over the floor to you. Okay. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, it's a really great pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, I've been a Sir subscriber for a couple of years. I was at the festival last year in Froome, and it was a great sort of honour and privilege to be presenting. And I've just been really inspired by all the great talks that we've uh, that we've had over the last couple of days. So yeah, yeah, kind of final final stretch now. But yeah, I'm sure you're all feeling as inspired um, as as me. Um, I guess before I go into any further, I I, I want to try and make this as interactive as possible within the obvious constraints that we've got. So I'm going to propose sort of three three parts to this. Um, I'll introduce myself a little bit more and 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 a new citizenship new, new citizenship project uh, as well, uh, but also introduce like the wider problem that we were trying to solve by developing these modes of participation. Um, so I, I think there will be probably something that most people will, will find quite familiar. I'll then spend sort of maybe 20 minutes or so um, talking through the seven modes. Uh, which is basically our contribution to the problem, our kind of provisional sort of solution or kind of contribution to this problem. Uh, and then finally, at the end, I think, I mean, of course, I'll do a QA and a of, um, you know, any questions you have about the seven modes that we put, that we describe. Um, but I really, really want to hear how other people have dealt with this issue of participation in the democratic, uh, the democratic economy. Uh, what things have worked, what things haven't. I think particularly around the question of inclusion and participation, would be, I'd really love to hear about that. Um, so yeah, absolutely, I invite anyone who wants to, to come step up and join me on the virtual stage by sharing audio and video, and we can do that. Okay, does that sound good? Maybe just, maybe just write chat, just put sounds good in the chat, if that sounds good, <laughs> and I'll, I'll, I'll get started. Okay, so um, so thank you so much, Hannah, for uh, for it sounds epic. That's, that's Hannah. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much, Hannah, for the introduction. Um, as you say, I've I've been involved. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll introduce myself a little bit more first. Um, so I've been involved with the community ownership movement for five years. Um, I was involved with the community takeover at Bath City Football Club. If you look very closely in that picture, you've got Ken Loach in the middle, socialist film director, Bath City fan. I'm just behind him. I'm right right in the back there. Um, so yeah, we, we worked very hard putting that together. It took us sort of two years to get to the point where we were able to uh, take the club into community ownership. And I think we, we experienced something that probably many kind of naive, well-meaning um, community groups experience when you do these community takeovers, uh, that we assume that by creating a democratic ownership structure, as soon as we flicked the switch and became community owned, there'd be this massive outpouring of democratic engagement and just general participation would all kind of just come flowing through naturally because look, it's a democracy, it's a community thing, <laughs> it's yours. Um, and, you know, guess what? There's sp spoiler alert, um, this didn't quite happen right away. And it's been this kind of ongoing puzzle for us that we haven't cracked at Bassett Football Club, so you know, we haven't cracked it yet, but um, this puzzle of how do we get people to engage 
know, people are coming through the turnstiles, uh, but you know, people aren't necessarily coming to AGM. Uh, you know, the, the governance is hard to fill positions on the on on the board and so on and so forth. Um, and yeah, so I wonder if maybe some of you guys are are, are experiencing the same thing. Uh, you know, maybe you're a community business, but the community isn't quite participating or really getting engaged. Maybe you're a co-op and you've got members, but they're not as actively participating in it as you want. Maybe you run some kind of campaign uh, or a community, like a, just a kind of community, community organization, charitable activity, and, and again, you just haven't really got that that kind of traction um, and the kind of rich, rich, the kind of rich relationships that, that you like uh, that you'd like to kind of achieve with people. So yeah, like how, how do we get people to get really stuck into what we're doing? How do we how do we build those kind of strange relations, those strong relationships uh, and attachments? Um, yeah, Susan Seal's already saying ringing bells here. All sounds familiar, lol. Actually, what would be great, um, if you don't mind, maybe in the chat, could you just put down like briefly like the just the broad category of the kind of organization that you're with? So just co-op, social enterprise, charity, initiative, or maybe just maybe you're a just a consultant, maybe you're a consultant. Just just very briefly to give me a little flavor of just sort of who I'm talking work, uh, worker co-op. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> workers co-ops, okay, brilliant. <laughs> yeah, CBS, social enterprise, worker co-op. Transition initiative, public sector all the way, Simon, brilliant, yeah. Yeah, CLTs, Community Hub, CIC, Housing Co-op, CIC, CIC. Okay, so we have quite, yeah, quite a broad, uh, Jeff Charity as well. Yeah, we have quite, quite a broad crowd here, yeah. okay, excellent. Okay, so, but we've all, we've all kind of faced this, we've all faced this kind of issue. Uh, right, so anyway, last year I joined the new uh, citizenship project, NCP, as we like to abbreviate it to, not, not the car park. Um, and in part, one of the reasons I joined them was because I saw this report on everyday participation and it really piqued my interest. And I sort of got in touch and so sort of one thing led to another and now I, now I work there. So anyway, we at NCP, uh, our mission is to build a more um, participatory society, more participatory uh, economy, uh, more participatory politics and more participatory communities. Uh, we're trying to shift the, the story of the individual in society from a passive kind of consumer to an active citizen. And so we're, we're a consultancy and think tank that works with organizations to sort of help bring that shift uh, into fruition. And, and you know, we worked across all, all different sectors, so Co-op Group, The Guardian, we're currently working in Kirkley's Council, kind of doing local government work as well. So we, we kind of work across the board. So given that we're trying to bring about a more participatory economy and society, unsurprisingly, we are kind of participation nerds right we're, we're fascinated by the different um dimensions of participation different styles different flavors different practices different modes it's a question that we're kind of um a, a obsessed with because i mean to say the obvious participation can take uh many different forms now again it sounds obvious but it's a really important point to underline because what we've seen is that sometimes as organizations uh, try to increase participation they can actually limit themselves by only focusing on the kind of the one or two modes of participation that they're already used to. So if you're a social enterprise, you're just thinking, how do we get more people to buy our product? Um, you know, if, you, if you're a membership uh, um, organization, you're thinking, how do we get more people to join as members? How do we get more people to stand for our committee? If you're a campaign group, you're thinking, how do we get more people to sign our petitions? You've got your kind of theory of change in your action, and, and you, you're just kind of focused on, on, on those core activities. I think the exciting challenge for us is how can you expand and enrich the way that you think about participation uh, to you know, create more avenues, open more doors, uh, create more opportunities for people to get involved in different ways. That, that doesn't mean that you abandon and move away from the traditional modes or kind of core modes that you're used to using. But we just want to nudge people to think a bit more um, holistically, I guess, about how you invite people in to participate. Because the hope is that if you widen your thinking, you will draw more people in to participate. And you know, we would hope um, that if you offer more diverse ways to participate, you might get more diverse people participating. Um, and that would be, uh, yeah, we're very interested to explore that later in in in, in the Q and A. So, Laura, right, I'm going to introduce this project. Uh, just to give you a bit of the background of how this this came about. This came out of some work that uh, NCP originally did with the cooperative movement. So we ran a, a collaborative um, I, uh, innovation project uh, with a co-op group, a Lincolnshire co-op, phone co-op, and, uh, and, and nationwide, a, a, a mutual, um, to explore how they can increase and enrich participation. 
And the question here was, you know, how can cooperatives work together with staff and customers and members to achieve more and not just sell products? And by achieve more, we, we meant it's both commercially, but also in terms of, the, of, of their social impact. And I, I just clarify, like, we think that this, you know, we, we developed this with co-ops, we, we think this applies um, more broadly. But this is this is what we discovered, you know, in, in this kind of you know collaborative process. Like this is rough cooperatives tend to engage with people. There's economic participation on the one hand, so you know, buying products, choosing options, maybe, maybe giving some customer feedback. And then there's governance, voting for representatives, standing for committees, kind of making big strategic decisions. And yeah, we just found that many cops were kind of focusing on one or the other of these of these two parts. So one being quite a light touch, simple way that there's maybe mass participation on the economic side, and the governance side, you're usually getting you know a small number of people who are kind of really into it, but it's hard to grow that. So what we sort of uncovered through this process was that there's really fertile ground, we think, for innovation and engagement that's in the middle there. Uh, it's in, it's in these what we call these everyday practices. So they're slightly more fluid um, than the kind of governance practices, but they're a bit more involved as well than just simply just buying and kind of um, economic exchange. And as we started to explore this middle space, yeah, we, we arrived at this idea of kind of um, everyday participation as something that can be useful for co-ops. Um, and yeah, here are, you know, all, all the, Put them here up front. We identified seven ways from that you know, from that process. We we kind of crystallize this into seven modes, which you can use to enable people to participate. Again, not to replace the traditional ways that you're already doing it, but these are possible new ways in for people to begin contributing to your mission and getting involved with your organization. So, as promised, what I will do right now, I will outline each one in turn. I'll give an example of um, you know, an um, and, um, organization which, is, which has used it. And I'll give you some potential starting points or kind of questions that you might use as a kind of jumping off point to create your version. Um, if you want, this, 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 this would be really cool. If any of these modes kind of gives you an idea right away of what your, your, your worker co-op or your campaign or such an enterprise might want to do, please do jump in and put it in the chat. That, that would be really cool if people wanted to do that. Or indeed, if it reminds you of something you're already doing, uh, or something you've already seen uh, someone else doing, again, put it in the chat and we can almost build a little mini encyclopedia of, of examples um, as we go. Okay, I'll have a quick sip of water and then dive in. Great, okay, so, where am I? The first one of participation we identified was tell stories. And what we mean by this is not, not you telling stories, but when you invite people to share their stories about why your organization or its purpose and mission is special to them. So you're giving people a framework and a structure to share their personal experiences as they relate to your mission. Um, some inspiration here is The Brigade. Uh, it's a social enterprise restaurant in London that provides apprenticeships to help uh, homeless people find employment in the hospitality sector. And what they do there is that throughout the venue, there are framed photographs of the staff, with introductions uh, to their stories. So th I mean, this is something which not only sort of builds and boosts uh, the kind of staff confidence and pride, but also showcases the purpose of the, of the brigade uh, to diners. So it, it gives an opportunity for workers to, to participate beyond simply giving their, 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 their labor. Um, just thinking about more broadly how this could be useful, uh, um, you know, uh, these sorts sort of authentic stories of people's personal experience of your kind of business or um, organization's purpose, they can serve as quite effective marketing tools and awareness raising tools, uh, and, but also kind of uh, you know, harvesting, well, I shouldn't say harvesting, you know, creating a platform for these kind of, um, kind of simple and shareable stories is also kind of useful market research. It's actually a good way of learning more about you know, what, what people, you know, your audio, you know, uh, uh, research into how you how, how you can uh, uh, develop your campaign or, or, or so on, or even for capturing and communicating your social impact. So it is really useful to, to, to get people to tell them stories. Uh, a possible starting point, so here's just some questions you might ask yourself or your team if you take this away. How could collecting and sharing stories help you build confidence, focus, or celebrate what you do? Uh, what stories could people tell or share on your behalf? And you know, how can you invite people to tell their stories? What kind of mechanisms? 
to see if anyone's going to bite. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll let you keep thinking about that. Okay. Second one is gathering data. And again, it's not you gathering data. This is asking people to collect information with you as part of a data gathering exercise. Um, the inspiration that we've got here is the RSPB who run the Big Garden Bird Watch every year. It's got quite a famous um, uh, sort of program with um, inviting people to become citizen scientists by sharing sightings of uh, specific birds in their gardens and localities. Um, and the key thing is that by, by harnessing uh, citizen power and kind of, kind of this idea of citizen scientists, the RSPB has not only created a data set uh, that it could never have built on its own, so you know, you know, there's a real sort of scientific or you know, kind of is, is a, a useful resource in that, in, in that respect. But it's really forged a deeper engagement with members and the public, uh, kind of giving them this opportunity to contribute to and help shape the future of the charity. So it goes beyond simply, you know, I, I pay my money as a member and I, you know, they go and do all the great work for me. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I mean, more generally, I think this kind of data gathering, you know, it, it, it can be a really useful way to develop your services, products, and your policies. Um, but it can also be a really good campaigning tool um, if you're trying to harness the energy and capacity of your supporters uh, to develop an evidence-based campaign around systemic change. Then having them gather the data uh, as part of that, you sort of add some uh, legitimacy and, and in, in engagement to that. So as a starting point, you might ask yourselves um, what information would be really great to get, but really needs more perspectives than just our own. Um, and yeah, what data could members help you gather that would help you to make the case for a change that you would uh, you want to see in the world? Okay, moving on to our third mode, share connections. So this is around this is about kind of providing an incentive, a structure, and a purpose. For your supporters or customers to talk about um, you know, your business or organization and its mission and purpose to others so you, you, to connect you to more people or, or indeed to connect to each other the inspiration we've got here is something called three things for calgary this was a participatory project started by the mayor of calgary uh, in canada in 2010. Um, it was basically an online mechanism that helps citizens uh, identify three acts they're going to take three actions big or small that would make a positive difference in the places where they live. But the key part of it was that once you sort of made this sort of commitment and chosen these acts, you then invite and encourage at least three people to do the same. It's a bit like the ice bucket challenge, I suppose. I mean, maybe, maybe that's the kind of the most famous example of this. Um, but the key thing being is that you create a kind of a structure and a purpose for people to open up their social networks, uh, to, you know, allowing people to kind of contribute to something meaningful in a kind of fun, engaging way or really kind of capitalizing on the power of, of their social networks. Yes, it's, it is less painful than that's like a challenge. Um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, so this mode we think is, is, is a great marketing tool. If that, you know, if you're running a, a business, uh, particularly for harnessing that reach of social media, but also I think probably a good campaign tool, um, uh, in, insofar as it encourages and equips members to communicate with each other about the, the organization's purpose within their networks, both sort of digitally and uh, in, in, in person. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We have. A, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll come. Yeah, we get, get some good contributions in the chat. So I'll, uh, I'll come back to. You. So yeah, a, uh, a starting point for this could be asking yourselves, you know, how can you tap into people's social networks and ties in a structured way to make your purpose spread further? And if you want inspiration, one thing could be just think: when's the last time that you did something for another organization along these lines? What could you learn? When's the last time you sort of put, you know? press retweet or added some personal content or, you know, uh, in, invited your friends to participate in something that someone else is doing. Uh, and think about how that worked and what, what you might. Okay, number four is contribute ideas. Um, so yeah, basically sharing a problem or an opportunity that you're working on with a wider group of people outside your organization and asking for their ideas. Um, I think this is uh, especially effective for product or service innovation or kind of overall ideas of how your business could do better, or for any kind of big unsolved strategic challenges that require people to think or act differently. Uh, the example we've given here is Co-op Group. Um, they worked for a year, over a year, working with members to develop a new um, travel insurance product. So members were able to kind of share experiences of buying and claiming on insurance products and suggest kind of new ideas through online surveys and face-to-face -face workshops. 
the key thing here is that it wasn't wasn't sort of like customer feedback or focus group testing. Uh, the members were involved from the very beginning to develop it and prototype those ideas, um, you know, not just kind of brought in at the end for um, sort of market testing. Um, and th there's also real emphasis on uh, um, attracting ideas and perspectives from members with sort of uh, very specific unmet needs in the kind of travel insurance uh, space. Uh, they've also achieved quite promising results with member designed wine, which you can see here. So it's quite hard to visually uh, kind of visually show travel insurance. So come with the wine instead. But the, they've done also kind of a member designed wine and uh, and uh, pizza as well, um, uh, which have done very well because yeah, they've sold a lot faster than they would expect because of that member um, uh, in, in, in involvement. One point for that. Yeah, is there a challenge that you've been facing that could really benefit from some kind of group thinking or collective intelligence? Um, and yeah, how can you use your communication channels or, or your kind of maybe your physical premises, depending on the COVID situation, to kind of pose a question or a challenge to your supporters to kind of uh, attract their in, in an open-ended way and see, you know, see, see what, what comes back? What might that invitation look like? Okay, number five, uh, give time. So, right, so we're talking here about volunteering, uh, but particularly we're talking about offering people opportunities to do sort of short but meaningful tasks to help your organization. So as opposed to maybe like a more structured volunteer, I mean, I'm sure many of your um, organizations probably depend on people volunteering on a pretty much full-time basis or regular basis. This is more about how can you make sort of bite-sized chunks that people can just sort of try out. Um, the, the inspiration is the Park Run, obviously very famous um, example. Um, uh, was, I mean, each local park run is run entirely by volunteers, so it's only really possible because people are giving their time. I think it's probably quite an important factor that whatever it is you're doing, it can only be done uh, through volunteering. Um, uh, and I think what's interesting about Park Run is that the way it's set up is there's a very wide range of volunteering and participation opportunities depending on people's interests and abilities. Uh, so you know, it's easier for people to kind of find a slot that they can fit into. Uh, and I think, you know, at, at this point, over 4 million participants so far in, 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 in Parkrun, but, but over half a million volunteers have, have, have supported it. So it, it's, it's huge, really. Um, yeah, so why is it useful? I think it's, it's, it's a good way. I think this is a really good way to give people a different view of your organization by inviting them to get involved from the inside in a really hands-on ma manner. Without necessarily committing to, you know, <laughs> giving their lives away to, <laughs> to, uh, to kind of working for you, and I think it also can give people a different view of their community by doing this, which I think can build empathy and cohesion, and you know, it, it can also enhance your own social impact. Questions you might start from: What are kind of simple, short tasks that people could do for or with you, and how might you invite people to give their time? towards achieving goals that you share in common. Okay, getting to, into the home stretch. Um, this is a real favorite of ours. Uh, number six, learn skills. So this is around, you know, how can you provide opportunities for people to share and learn skills that relate to your goals and relate to your organization? Uh, the inspiration, I'm sure some of you will be familiar with the Restart Project. Uh, a social enterprise that encourages and empowers people to use their electronics for longer by actually equipping them with the skills and resources to repair them uh, rather than just kind of chuck them away. Um, I think what's interesting about Restart Cafe, I mean, I think whereas a repair cafe, I mean, repair cafes are obviously amazing and I, I, I use them. What's, what's kind of interesting and different about Restart Project is that rather than kind of repairing the electronics themselves, they're trying to catalyze a movement of re repairers. They're, they run these sort of restart parties with party kits that hosts can use, um, and the hosts are there actually try to try to share their repair skills and knowledge and kind of up, up, upskill people. Guests are able to kind of learn in a kind of very fun and, and informal environment. Um, but yeah, they're actually spreading those skills out uh, out, out to their base. Um, yeah, so as a starting point for that, um, you might ask, yeah, what well, what skills do you have that you can easily share or teach or Particularly, how could you become a platform for your supporters to teach each, each other skills related to your mission? So it's not, it's not necessarily just about you creating a training offer and just imparting skills. It, it, might, it might be that. But what would be really cool is what if you got everyone teaching each other 
um, skills that would sort of help uh, help your mission be pushed forward. So what would a kind of simple workshop or teach-in type look like um, at, at your um, organization? Okay, I'm gonna say a final one. Um, yeah, well, sorry. <laughs> um, I meant to change this. Crowdfund innovation. We, we, we drop the innovation usually when we get this presentation because it's, it's a bit, you know, but basically crowdfunding is kind of kind of what we're talking about. Maybe what we mean is crowdfund new things. So perhaps if you're a city farm, you might crowdfund a duck pond. I don't know whether the duck pond is, is innovative or disruptive, but you know, it's just a new thing. Um, but yeah, so it'd be, the, the basic idea being asking people to fund uh, new products or services or features so on before they exist. Um, or kind of adding features improvements to your um, existing products and services. Um, I mean, the really obvious example in our world is, you know, community share offers, you know, taking over pubs and, you know, football clubs, sticking up solar panels, building new stadiums, all that kind of stuff. Um, so, I mean, that's that's kind of crowdfunding on, on a major scale. But I think possibly you know, kind of simple reward-based crowdfunding campaigns could also work for smaller scale projects. Uh, where you're just trying to support the development of a new product or a new service or, or, or program or a new feature. It doesn't have to be like a huge strategic uh, thing necessarily. Um, because I think, you know, and, you know the, the, the advantages would be, you know, when you, when you sort of do it this way, a lot of your new product development and concept testing, uh, you know, I think as we saw a little bit with the co-op example before with the people giving ideas, um, you can build a lot of member engagement and loyalty towards a thing before it even exists. You have an audience for a product before it even exists. Um, so that can be a really good way to reinforce relationships and loyalty uh, you know, between customers and your um, existing products and services. So yeah, starting point for that. Um, what's an idea that you've been sitting on for a while that others could help make a reality with a bit of capital? Uh, and yeah, how could you come up? I mean, this is thinking about the rewards. Like what kind of rewards could you offer? What kind of experience or non-financial reward could you offer to people who contribute money that might build that engagement further? Okay, so right, those are the seven. Just finally, before we kind of go over the Q&A, I just want to, this is the last slide. Just want to share this. Um, these are the three principles that we encourage organizations to embrace um, when they're starting to design in general, you know, a more participatory strategy or culture. Um, so this might help to guide you as you put the seven modes into practice. So it's purpose platform prototype. Purpose is just making sure that you've got the right starting point uh, when you begin to generate ideas, you know, ideas for participation and opportunities. It can always be tempting to start by thinking, how do we get more people involved in what we're already doing? And it's maybe good to shift that to how can we get people to participate more widely in our purpose and our mission, uh, which you know, or, or rather, you know, the shared mission that we have, the mission we share with our supporters. You know, how, how can we make that happen? So just, just kind of you know, widening out your scope of vision a little bit. Um, the platform bit means asking you: know, Does this participation opportunity that we're generating actually give people agency? Like, does it really allow them to take? genuine action for the wider cause that they care about so with you does it tap into their creativity their unique experiences as opposed to just ask you. so for example you know the, the the three things for calgary it, it wasn't the government saying here's a hundred things that'd be really great if you guys could do pick three of them you know people generated their own ideas it was their own creativity so that's quite important and the final thing i would just say would be prototype um we would really encourage organizations not to sort of overthink or over plan these kind of participation opportunities too much. Um, they're, they're supposed to be everyday and fluid. So just try them out. Just try a simple version, see what works, learn by doing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it doesn't have to be expensive or time consuming. I think that's usually the pushback we get. It's like, oh, we just haven't got money. This will be great. But like, oh, it's another thing, isn't it? You can start small and just see where it takes you. And, and, and you know, if it's not delivering benefit, then try something else. So, but yeah, you don't need to kind of massively overthink it. Okay, so there you go. I'll, I'll leave those up just as, as a reference point in the slides. Um, but yeah, that, that's our that's our contribution to this question of how do we how do we do it? Uh, I'm just going to start scanning the chat now, see what other people are saying as well.
That's great. Hand. And I yeah. just I just wanted to jump in yeah, on it. Right, well. like, yeah. It's really exciting. Um, I feel like it's really relating to a couple of chats that, that we've had um, previously in the festival. So talking with Math Pots about bad kindness. And it's really interesting mm. how, you know, often we can think that we can sort of issue out kind acts that actually there's no reciprocity in. And I think mm. what's really exciting about participation is that, you know, there are themes of kind of we've got service users and service providers and actually that's such a disempowering language to use mm -hmm. and the language of participation is such an invite and at the same time you know what's really nice about the festival talking about like play and, and opportunities to be creative and actually it seems like with with every single one of the seven modes there's so many opportunities to play with that and mm -hmm. you know and and share ideas and that kind of thing so yeah I'm really keen now if anybody's interested to I don't know if you're going to say this as well or longer to get people to come up and chat with us yeah. if you're interested but while we're waiting yeah should we have a look at some of the comments that people have dropped in yeah I mean may maybe um I can pick some people who are going to invite us. Jojo Spinks talking about we recruit yeah I mean Jojo I don't want to put you under pressure but if you'd like to come up and tell us a bit more about this you recruit a kind of super participant activity in their neighborhood oh, i see yeah yeah um don't accept funding in place so oh, great. Yes, oh here we go. please yeah <laughs> you jump in at her now i think she's coming in so i think once i've asked for her to join um she just has to click on accept i think that's great and then we'll see if we can line anyone else up who might want to come and join us as well uh, yeah, I don't know, like Sylvie, if you might be interested as well, Sylvie Rackham, to talk about, don't feel like you have to, by the way, <laughs> but you are more than welcome. I have invited, um, I have invited Jojo, but do you want to pop into the comments, Jojo, if you're, oh, I don't think it's working for you. Oh, no problem. Okay. Oh, that's mm -hmm. a shame. Do, do feel well, free to try again, yeah. but. Uh, Rachel as well. Rachel was talking about using pre-sales to prove demand for environmental products in local shops, which also helps small businesses take leaps to do things like install a refill station and helps the community feel the ownership in that project. Yeah, again, a form of kind of crowdfunding or pre-sales, I think uh, can be very effective. Um, um, oh, great. Let's have a chat with you, Rachel. Hi Rachel. Hiya. How's it going? It's good, thank you. Yeah, it's really good. I'm I'm very much enjoying Stir to Action. Um, Brilliant. And this session in particular, I, yes, people at the beginning were saying love the new citizenship project, and me too. Um, yeah, I just was actually going to make a comment about play and um, the tone in which you do things and how um, that invitation is really welcome and like just so we we um my company's called our pledge and it is effectively crowdfunding but we we always make sure people know that they're basically just pre-buying things and proving demand and it helps everyone kind of make make this change together um but i just really flippantly at one point was like oh you know people who pledge we'll call them pledgeons and so anyone who pledges is a total pledgeon and they got a total pledgeon tote bag and i've never had so much positive feedback for a pun in my life <laughs> and it, I just think that sort of playful tone really, really helped. And um, so, yeah, I just wanted to kind of reiterate that point that the joy of doing something together is really, um, is really, really welcomed. And I think particularly in environmentalism, there can be a real heaviness to, mm. oh, God, I've got to do this thing. And, oh, the, you know, like there's so many, it's just it's too big. And if you can do a little bit of you know, human nature wants to play, wants to get together, wants to, you know, feel safe, like they're amongst other people. Like that's another thing that I think crowdfunding helps with is like, oh, well, they're doing it and they're doing it so I can do it. And that makes me feel part of the community. Um, and then we had a party for everyone at the end. And again, mm -hmm. we thought no one would come and we couldn't fit everyone in. So it was, yeah, just I just wanted to kind of really celebrate that spirit of play. Yeah. No, excellent. Thank you. No, I, 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 I totally agree. And just thinking, 
yeah how, how can we find more ways in for people that are just a bit simpler and friendlier um and again it doesn't mean that you then think oh well, agms are rubbish and they're pointless let's not worry about them but it, you know it's if that's your first offer to people then you're always going to struggle <laughs> yeah yeah for sure and yeah. people do want to talk about things like yeah people are curious but i think one one thing that i'm definitely aware of is that there is there can be a a sort of um anticipated reticence around getting involved with something if you're not really if you don't normally have those conversations or you know it, you think there's a type of person um mm. who does who who you know works with their community or whatever and actually when it gets down to it everyone wants to get involved and feel mm. like they've done something that's positive so um yes that making it sort of welcoming is also really really good mm -hmm. No, thank you. Thank you. I will leave the <laughs> nice. Thanks, Rachel. <laughs> That's great. We've had um, uh, Wes is saying pledgens and disruptive ducks. This is my session of the week. Quite proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> and then Andrew saying regarding play, why not have a carnival? Maybe we can really um, yeah. have a participation party. Yeah, Maria. Maria's giving great examples as well. I don't know if you want to join in, or we can just read out, we can read out what you said, Maria, but the examples of, uh, yeah, calling your community champions morale officers. Oh, yep, she's, yep, she's gonna join. Working, yay. Hi, Maria. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, um, yeah, we, we had a nature group, and um, I jokingly called it tree huggers, and everyone was like, oh, you can't call it that, ha, 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 ha. Um, and we stuck with it and we have a group and we meet regularly with them and the um, yeah the ladies of support group was a really funny one because I just called it sweaty betties because that's what happens and then um, people just thought it was hilarious so they wanted to find out more so it's something that we've talked about we have a lot of different um, a lot of different projects and activities within our organization and throughout all of it we've tried to keep a sense of humor um we we don't like we don't we don't like sort of meetings and committees and all that kind of stuff we like to just get on with it and we found that by changing the language that we use in everything that we do to to show the real side of us so when we when we make mistakes we'll take a photograph of it and stick it on social media um you know what we will we'll keep everything light and happy and it really seems to give that you're real your person your um you're all you're all in it together you know um we're probably an organization that we've actually kind of got total imposter syndrome the whole way through but actually we're doing it and we're making it happen so are we really imposters but we that's how we feel so that's what we put across and actually mm. it, it it makes things happen so mm. it's been it's been really really interesting um to hear today what you've been talking about because mm. it, I, we've actually tapped into most of the seven things that you've done and we're experimenting yeah, yeah. with it Brilliant. and um, at the moment we've got a morale officer project which is work, working out of mutual aid but gathering people together and we decided we'll just call them morale officers and we put it on the back of a t-shirt and people are like oh my god that's brilliant <laughs> um, you know it's about people smiling at each other it's not you know it doesn't have to be any more than just smile at your neighbours with a t-shirt on um check in with them so yeah brilliant thank you great that sounds really good yeah thanks for sharing maria great well i'm just gonna yeah. see maria happy to press the little leave button not that we want to boot yeah. you off obviously but <laughs> don't worry that's Bye. fine Bye. Have you got it? Bye. Mm. Um, and we've got a uh, phil's just um said he doesn't mind popping in so i'll just see if he wants to do he wants to pop in and and ask and in the meantime while we're waiting for that um roxy's just asked any climate action groups here would love to hear experiences to get ideas for my local climate action group we want to engage as many people as possible mm. um so yeah flag up if you are um mm. and then well, i mean it'd be interesting just in general people on the call like if you're a climate action group and you how would you use these stories like like how sorry how do you use these these modes like what are the things you could get people to gather data around to build a case how do you get people to tell stories that were around climate action like what would that look like um yeah people have ideas we can 
do a little collective thinking now maybe i don't know yeah absolutely well i've just um i've just asked phil to join so maybe yeah if he he, he gives us a little bit of a sort of his experience of participation with home farm and then yeah i wonder if we could almost do a little little brainstorm or something mm -hmm. see how mm -hmm. it goes great i've just invited phil so see if he pops up this is very exciting mm -hmm. <laughs> so nice hearing people's projects and just that element of fun is is so critical really really nice how are you doing phil i wonder if you're having a similar problem um that we had earlier could possibly be i can't see how to join so have you have you tried the um oh because you must have already pressed the blue button in the right hand corner um do you want to try pressing it one more time and then a little white box should come up that's asking about your sort of audio and video preferences and if you scroll down that box it's got a blue button button at the bottom that says apply or join or something like that um but in the meantime I might see does anyone else want to have a go as well because we've got i think we've still got a good 20 minutes yeah, to chat think, um um susan Steele has talked about so this i guess this is kind of governance thing in a way mm. the idea of the mini citizens assembly format mm. and so I, i'm scrolling up you're from a workers co-op susan is that right join if you if you if you're free um so yeah, adopting a mini citizen assembly format to engage more members in the decision-making process, randomly selecting a group of members, uh, supplying them with an information pack, giving them time to read it and digest it, and then come together for a facilitated discussion to reach a collective decision, which can be fed back to the board. I'd be really interested to learn more about how that's been effective, how that's worked. Um, but yeah, but, but, but also how, whether you think um, these other types of kind of uh, lighter touch everyday participation, kind of less structured um, modes could be useful in the context of a workers' co-op. If that is indeed, yeah, I'm scrolling back. I'm pretty sure that's what you're Yeah, Susan's put Suma, Whole Foods. Oh, right, okay, yeah, yeah. of course, yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah, whether, whether that could be, you know, whether those other lighter touch ones might be a way of um, um, increasing some, some engagement as well. So yeah, be, yeah, if you're able to join, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, we, yeah, we're having a few um, suggestions coming in sort of specifically for climate action. Um, so we've got Andrew saying divest East Sussex, um, made chicken masks and had a Zoom party with people invited to cluck away to <laughs> highlight how fossil fuel investments are coming home to roost as they become stranded assets. God, people are so clever. <laughs> so clever that's i suggest a whole, that's a whole other mode you've invented there i don't know yeah number <laughs> eight number eight <laughs> chicken party love it yeah um great so what else have we got um da -da. and then yeah rachel sort of put a description of our pledge and what you get up to i'm going to try um if we've got someone else come on and talk in a mo to put up a few links to some of this stuff that you're all doing and you're all up to because i know it'll probably be a really interesting resource um so i think in the meantime until someone else maybe wants to come and join us um a question for you oliver is um is maybe you know yeah how can people sort of directly interact with the new citizenship project um are there multiple ways to kind of come and come and work with it and and take ideas and inspiration from it uh yeah i mean please do i'll, I'll put our um uh, website in the chat now um i guess we have in over over the over the years um we, we do both kind of direct consultancy with with organizations so typical sort of client client work so to speak but we also do run um collaborative innovation programs at least sort of once a year or so where we'll bring together kind of six to eight organizations for nine to twelve months and work around a particular question it's usually around one sector so we've done something we, we did work in the future of food and food citizenship uh, we've done work in the cultural heritage sector uh the cooperative sector which is obviously this project i'm describing now um the mem membership organizations the whole thing around the future membership and with those um collaborative innovation processes we produce reports and toolkits off the back of them so if you go to our website and have a poke around we've developed a number of these kind of toolkits a number of these sort of structures and frameworks like all quite easy to use i hope and um 
you know, kind of kind of user friendly. So please do check yeah, do check out our website and see what other kind of resources and toolkits that might fit your organization or um, you know in, inspire you to be able to run little mini workshops and things uh, you know with with your stakeholders. I think yeah that that would be great. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't, I, I've been trying at the moment to get something together around the future of mission led business. So if there are people who want to are interested in um, talking about that and, and sorry in particular like how you can use mission and business as a platform for people to do more than just buy your ethical product but actually take other types of action um yeah and actually yeah, i'm kind of stuck actually so yeah if anyone wants to talk to me about that, that that'd be great you can contact me directly that sounds um, good yeah so i've had a um a request nick and i'm i'm very happy to do this nick um can we all download our engagement ideas for climate action onto a shared document somewhere because it is hard sometimes to come up with ideas that are fun and yet get the message across nick yeah i'm very happy to do that i'll i'll have a think um i'll have a think about the best platform to do that on but i'm sure that's a possibility and then question from holly yeah. the idea of play really appeals to me but i am shy do you have any thoughts on navigating shyness in this kind of work both for facilitators and for community members whose inhibitions might get in the way a really important question yeah and i don't know if someone who's kind of in the play has done stuff with, with play wants to either jump back in or answer in the chat I mean, I guess one of the things I mean, from the perspective of the talk about the modes of participation, I think one of the things about it is that you can you can use these modes to develop different um, different levels of collectiveness around each participation opportunity and different levels of having to be face to face with other people. Uh, someone actually kind of criticised this, I think, fairly. Uh, when we, or, or, sorry, sorry, I critiqued it by saying all of these modes you're suggesting are quite individualistic. It's people just kind of are still individually coming and. In, contribute an idea or doing something for you like it doesn't speak as a collective i think you can kind of decide what degree of collectivism you you, you bring into each of these modes or each one of these participation opportunities but yeah where people are maybe shy and don't want to get in a room with people and sort of tell their story in front of a bunch of people then yeah things like gathering data you know your own and you know you know feeling a sense of participation in the project without having to be extroverted um i think if you start to use these different modes you can start to hit different people of different kind of sensibilities um so yeah i think that's yeah anyway that's from my perspective yeah if other people who are um uh know more about play have a better answer to that um yeah maria saying for those facilitating it's really a case of working on self-confidence first nick saying check out the quiet connections for tools Oh, Client Connections has tools in it, yeah. Yeah, both people that run it are shy, but run their own social enterprise, that's great. Great. Uh, and then, uh, oh, yeah, yeah Dojo's got a participation framework. Uh, we make it clear there's lots of different ways to get involved, including online only, only options. Um, great, and someone suggested a G Drive, so a, a Google Docs, so I'll go and set one of those up mm. now and share it. Great. So we've got I've got about 12 minutes. I know we can cram loads into that. Um, so I'll yeah. just have a, a scroll up through again. Don't forget, if you want to jump in and join us, um, do just request to share audio and video. Um, and then, yeah, let's just have a look. So, oh, great. I've got Nick. Brilliant. And Nick, I was just about to read Nick's. Uh, um, Nick likes dressing up. <laughs> Which is no bad thing, Nick. That's not bad. <laughs> just, you know, I, I was starting to write a really long-winded message, and my typing is getting tired. So I thought I'd just come on and say, yeah. storytelling thing is a thing that's really important, but it's the hardest thing about being in the climate emergency and not being all doom and gloom. And mm. and I think that's why so many people have switched off. Because and it's not because the storyteller isn't good they literally don't want to know because it's their way of denying it's happening and they you know they're scared and so it's trying to so when you're storytelling what you're always trying to do i think is trying to what, say what would the alternative look like you know because the problem is that we don't have an alternative to the apocalyptic doom message which you know the world's going to end it's all going to be shit so what's the alternative? And because it's so such a vast problem, so interconnected, and it's a systems change and a whole range of different issues, it's actually really hard to kind of 
I find it really hard anyway to kind of get across to people what the utopia is going to look like, <laughs> if you see what I mean. Mm. Mm. I don't have got any tips. Well, I mean, so the way you're framing it is that you, that you are the one telling the story to other people. And I, I wonder what the space would be like. I don't know what it would look like, but I wonder what the space would be like within the climate movement to, that, to give a platform for people to tell their stories about mm. climate, maybe their journey from having their head in the sand to caring about it, or maybe simply saying, I've adopted these um, new lifestyle changes and here's how, how it's going. Yeah. When I first got my local veg box, I thought, oh, there's a lot of mud on this. This is like, oh, but now I really love the fact that they send me stuff I don't know what it is, and I just, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I think that's the thing, getting out of maybe the persuasion mindset um, where you are the one persuading in the movement, the ordinary people to come join you. I mean, obviously, keep doing that. That's a separate thing, and that's the storytelling. Or yeah. storytelling. But how do you also create a platform for people to tell their stories about what this means to them? You know, yeah, I mean, that, I mean, the first March, you know, that, that kind of stuff. I mean, that, that's where I'd encourage you to maybe have a look. And just see see if it works. Just you know, try it out. See if that kind of yeah. Works. Now, when I talk, I tell it. I tell the story from my own journey mm. and mm. what I've done to try and change my lifestyle. Blah blah blah. Mm. Um, but I think the problem is that's you know it's quite a, that's quite a long conversation. So it's trying to find mm. when people say, well, okay, if we do all ditch fossil fuels or we stop cars, and how am I going to get to work? And it's you know it's always they kind of like the things you come up against. And obviously there are obvious answers, but it's kind of it's such a complicated future to envisage because there's so many things mm. that need to change mm -hmm. they're all interconnected and that's the bit I think probably what I'm trying to do too much is probably paint the bigger picture I should actually be just concentrating like say on the small things but the mm. problem is we haven't got what I find frustrating I suppose is I find you know we haven't got time to just do the small things the small things are really important mm. but actually we will do the really big things as well Mm -hmm. and that's about mm -hmm. whole life whole systems change whole lifestyle change so nick i am um, so yeah. yeah actually and i think rachel's posted it in the comments as well a really interesting uh, our festival last year um rob hopkins came and did a session on based sort of on his what what is to what if yeah. scenario yeah imagining and it was really great because we did i don't know if you were there but we did this collective storytelling where he went through the alphabet and he told a story that sort of he suggested the next letter and we had to come up with the next word so it was kind of like inviting you to tell your story of the future that you want mm. to imagine but giving you a bit of a structure to do that so it's not like tell your story mm. go and like mm. a fun playful thing so, oh, so yeah so is another your, to check is out. That, yeah is that on your festival page or anywhere I don't know if we've got that one recorded, but it's it's one he writes about in his book. He I think he writes That's a few bit, yeah. in his book. Mm. So it's called From What Is to What yeah. If. I like mm. the idea of the alphabet thing because I think mm. unless people participate, I mean I do these presentations all the time in local councils and parish councils, so it is very much me standing up to talk about climate emergencies, mm. that kind of thing. And it's very it's very hard to get people to participate. It's a completely alien thing to do at a parish council meeting to ask people that kind of mm. stuff. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I think that the engagement things is so important for the climate change stuff that we're all trying to do. And it's just hopefully as the media pick it up more, it will come easier. But the media at the moment don't really cover it in the right way, do they? The mainstream media. Mm. And, and they did with COVID. And that's why it was so, why was, you know, everything happened so quickly and fast because the media were picking it up because it's causing deaths in our country. And mm. the moment it's causing deaths somewhere else away not in our world mm. sort of thing so it's harder for people to yeah it's, it's always an issue of scale isn't it and yeah mm. making it feel like home mm. and participating in home well that's another um yeah so nick do you mind oh, not to boot yeah. you off but do you mind uh, <laughs> sorry. yeah i just wanted to pull out in the chat so yeah. you know, so chris dab's talking about how you know, people are telling stories of what they've liked about reduced pollution during lockdown. It could be again a way of telling stories about how you experience this uh, different future. Um, Sylvia saying, "I agree for change to happen. I feel like we need a story to visualize it." And then Rachel saying that XR Walton Forest uh, posted uh, ha haikus all over the borough, written by people in lockdown, which is a very beautiful Instagram. Well, a great example of yeah, people sort of telling telling to be being a part of where people tell their own personal stories that all kind of. Are personal about their creative agency, but then they'll add up to a, a greater mission. 
we've got Phil finally. I'm not sure if Hannah's still here, but uh, Phil, please go ahead. Oh, you are. Go ahead. I'm here. Yeah, welcome, Phil. <laughs> oh, I think, are you on mute? You might be on mute. Should be a little sound. Oh, we got you. No, I might not be able to hear you. Have you got a little? Um, let's see, I don't think I can do anything about it. My end. Just say something, Phil, just in case. Oh, oh no, we can't hear you. I'm so sorry. That's such a shame. We'll have to, um, yeah, I know I, a few people really, really wanted to hear about and I'm afraid we've only got five minutes left, so mm. I will, but I will put Home Farm in the link um, that when I put all of our resources together that we're talking about. Um, so, yeah, just where I've got five mm. minutes, um, just make sure we wrap up on time. It feels like we've had a really nice, engaging, lively discussion about um, all the different ways that you can participate have you got sort of any any wrap-up thoughts oliver oh, I um probably, i should probably you plug to... you asked me before i'm not sure if you were you were setting me up to do this uh, how we can engage with you of course we are there is a two and a half hour i guess new economy program session on this in october i should really know the date of it but i don't i'll just look at my calendar to see when that is um but yeah we we run one of these sessions already um uh, with uh the new this year um that was really interesting we were able to go into this in more detail and people were able to actually kind of take time to start developing ideas and prototypes um around what they could do for their, their organizations based on these modes uh, I think um, people enjoy I'm it. I'm so sorry, I'm I should know when October. it is as so well. The 21st of October is, at least I think, is in my diary as when we're, we're doing the uh, the next one. So yeah, if you wanted to come along and um, explore this in more detail, uh, create some more ideas and more of a kind of like a genuine workshop type scenario, um, please do join us in, in late October. And uh, yeah, I think that'd be really great. It was a really, it was really interesting last time because we had again a very diverse group of um, organisations and campaigns uh, who were um, engaging with it. Who asked, yeah, really tough questions around like how, how do you make sure all, all this is inclusive? You know, how do you um, generate participation opportunities for you know hard to reach, so-called hard to reach um, kind of uh, parts of the community? Um, yeah, we, we, I wouldn't say we particularly have the answers for, but um, yeah, so yeah, it, it, yeah, it'd be great to welcome more people to that in October if, uh, if you're up for it. Such a good plug, Oliver. That was really good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, we've got, so yeah, it's the year, the third year of our new economy program. Uh, so yeah, building on what we've, what we've done, working with awesome people we've already worked with like Oliver. Um, so it's a really great engaging way to kind of do next steps um mm. if you would like to learn more oliver thank you so very much um it's been an absolute pleasure really really lively yeah, for having me. no worries um so and thank you everyone for your comments what i will do is i will put uh, a link for a google doc in the main event chat so i suppose other people can pop in if they've got any ideas as well um and i'll see if i can capture like the whole chat as well and put that mm. in there because that'd be really cool i'll invite you to have a look at that oliver if you're if you're interested yeah, um great. so yeah without further ado we've got our last session coming up uh, of the festival and uh, then beyond that we'll also be doing a bit of a festival crew wind down debrief talk about what we loved um afterwards as well so you'll see that session pop up but for now um it's going to be over to um land ownership and racial justice that's with jacina um and mark and yeah mm. i think oliver's going to be there as will i um <laughs> So yeah, just leave you to say thanks everyone. Another really engaging session and see you all soon in some form or another. Bye-bye.